I'm Joelle Garrett and welcome to First Church. I'm so glad you're here this morning. I would like to invite you to sign in using the QR code in our bulletin to let us know you're here. What I love about First Church is that it truly is an open place for all and they love you with such a pure love. So welcome to First Church and happy holidays. Good morning. Welcome to First Church's virtual worship stream. My name is Katherine Mullen. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Minister of Community Engagement here. And I have some announcements that I'd like to share with you this morning. Our first announcement is about our farewell reception to Kristen Dedman. If you're able to join us after worship today, we will be sending off the Dedman family um, and saying goodbye to our beloved children's minister, Kristen Dedman. Their children are invited to draw a picture for Kristen and anyone from the congregation is invited to write a letter of love. There will also be a children's book for the congregation to sign with words of affirmation and appreciation. If you would like to contribute a love gift for Kristen, you're invited to mail a check to First Church with love gift to Kristen Dedman in the memo line, or you can go to our website and select the fund by the same name to give online. We will dearly miss Kristen and her family, so we hope that you can be present at the reception today after worship, or you are able to send her some words um, of appreciation for all of the work that she's done in the last two years for our church family. Our next announcement is about Longest Night. One of our first church traditions is to hold a Longest Night service on the winter solstice, the longest night of the year. During the service, we lean into our priority of practicing authenticity by providing sacred space to name our grief and to name our sadness. We recognize that many times the joy and expectation of Christmas overshadows the pain, grief, and hurt that we are experiencing in our lives. You're invited to join us in the sanctuary on Thursday, December 21st at 6 p.m. as we come together to mark our pain and sorrow on the longest night of the year. Our next announcement is about Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve worship schedules. On the morning of Christmas Eve, join us for worship hosted in the sanctuary at 11. There will only be one worship service in the morning and it will be in the sanctuary. On the evening of Christmas Eve, we are once again offering two evening services uh, for you to join with your church family. <clears throat> At 4 p.m., you are invited to attend a beautiful worship service in the loft. There will be coffee, cookies, and snacks before the service begins. During the service, there will be Christmas hymns and songs led by our band, um, Holy Communion, and candles to illuminate the space as we hold the mystery of Christ's birth. At 6 p.m., you are invited to attend our traditional sanctuary worship service led by our choir, where we will sing Christmas carols and hymns, receive Holy Communion at the altar, and light candles as we sing Silent Night. Come to either service, or better yet, stay for both. Finally, on New Year's Eve morning, Sunday, December 31st, you are invited to join us for worship hosted in the loft at 11 a.m. Just like Christmas Eve morning, there will only be one worship service available. But this morning, on the 31st, it will be hosted in the loft. Friends, there is so much going on here at First Church, and we hope that you are able to participate in some, most, or all of it. Uh, as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, greet each other in the comments uh, and welcome each other to this space today.
listen to our call to confession. If you spend any time with a child, you will quickly notice that children see the world differently. For a child, a ladybug is a miracle. A pine tree is a wonder. Curiosity is a love language. And water is not only for survival, but for joy. As adults, we forget this language of awe and wonder. And when we do, we distance ourselves from God. In confession, we have the opportunity to close that distance. So let us return to God with hearts wide open. Let us return to God in prayer. Holy God, somewhere in our childhood, we face pressure to outgrow awe. We turn into adults who obsess over data and facts. We praise those who have answers and assume that wonder is an answerless game. Forgive us for closing that door to you. Remind us that the kingdom of God belongs to children. Teach us the ways of awe and wonder so that like Zachariah, when we find ourselves speechless, our first words will be words of praise. With hearts open wide, we pray. Amen. How does a weary world practice joy? By dancing and throwing birthday parties, by hanging Christmas lights and holding sleepy babies, by singing loudly and looking for good news, by telling the story of Jesus and showing up for our community. There are a million ways to practice joy. So today we light the candle of joy as a reminder and a charge. With God's help, may we bring joy into a weary world. Amen. Will you pray with me this morning? Holy God, Christ with us. Once again, we bow our heads and we close our eyes. Once again, we draw ourselves closer to you in prayer. Meet us here. Surround us with your loving presence. From sunrise to sunset, you fill us with awe. And for that, we pause to give you gratitude. Thank you for the way the sun shines through our stained glass windows. For the warmth of a cup of coffee or hot chocolate. For the twinkle of Christmas lights and candles. For the gift of reading by the fire. For the joy of returning home for the love of community, and for the glory of a sky full of stars. God, we are in constant awe of you. The story of Zechariah and Elizabeth reminds us that there is nothing you cannot do, and there is no grief that you do not know. And for that, we give great thanks. However, even with this good news at hand, we know that there are many in this world today who cannot find the energy to practice awe or wonder, because they are so deep in grief. So God, we pray for those whom awe feels out of reach. Be with every parent who worries about a sick child. Be with every child who worries about a sick parent. Be with every person waiting on the doctor's phone call, waiting on the next month's paycheck, waiting for their next warm meal. Holy God, Surround those with broken hearts who are trying to stitch together the pieces, praying that one day they may be able to feel awe again. All the while, we will keep gathering together and turning to you to remind us that you are the God of the impossible. You are the one who floods our world with awe. You are the one who knows our names. So together we pray, using the words, that your son taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Good morning. At this time, I invite you all to hear our first scripture reading found in Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through 66. 
When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out who, what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet and everyone's astonishment. He wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began, began to speak praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who had heard this wonder asked about, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. As we move into a time of giving, I just want to name that in our sermon series, How Does a Weary World Rejoice?, this morning, we will answer that question. How does a weary world rejoice? We answer, we allow ourselves to be amazed. And this time, I want to highlight the number of ministry events that we have throughout the year that are amazing, and we're only able to do those things through your generosity. We have our church-wide retreat that we have every February at Camp McDowell. We're taking signups for that now. We have our Pride Parade and Pride Fest that we participate in every summer. We do arts camp and our youth take part in amazing youth events throughout the summer. Both of those events bring joy and wonder and amazement to our children and youth throughout the summer. We invited Matthew Vines just this past year to come and speak to our congregation on his book, God and the Gay Christian. And just this past Wednesday, we were able to share a lunch with our senior adults here at First Church. There were over 50 people that participated in that, among the number of many other opportunities we have in Advent. We just did beers and carols at High Wire Brewing. We have the longest night service on the 21st, and we have our beautiful Christmas Eve services as well. We're able to experience awe and wonder and amazement in this faith community because of your generosity. I want to thank you for that and ask you to continue to be generous with your giving. This time I invite you to give generously because we believe we are created out of a generous love.
Hi, I'm Stephanie York Arnold and I'm the senior pastor here at First Church. My pronouns are she and her. I'm so glad that you're joining us for this third Sunday in Advent. So let's begin with Zachariah and Elizabeth's story this morning. This weary older couple is pregnant. They've been shocked and bewildered at this good news. Now it threw Elizabeth into hiding and Zachariah into silence. Then Mary comes and joy is experienced through their shared connection. Being together unlocks their joy and it allows excitement to creep in even though they can't answer one another's questions with absolutes or certainty. Then comes Elizabeth's birth experience. It says neighbors shared her joy at this excitement. They, they come to circumcise the child on the eighth day and to name him. We must presume that the they would include their family and their neighbors. They are coming to do what they do. It's customary. Circumcise and name your child within the community. And of course you would name your child if it's a boy after his father or at least a male relative. So they come to name him for Zachariah. But Elizabeth speaks up and says, no, she wants to name him John. They turn to mute Zachariah to ask what he wants, and he says, John. This is wildly uncustomary. Zachariah is agreeing with his wife to name their child an unfamiliar name, and they are astonished. But as soon as he agrees with Elizabeth, he can suddenly speak. Fellows, did you notice that? All it took was agreement with his wife, and he could speak. When Zechariah begins to speak and praise God, affirming his wife's name choice, then the community turns to awe and wonder. And they talked about these things with others. The awe and the wonder about baby John, it spread. Who would he be? Awe is defined as a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear and wonder. No doubt the circumstances of John's conception, birth, and naming were awe-inspiring. No doubt some would feel fear at these circumstances and others' amazement. Life was not following the prescribed and customary path. And we all know folks can be funny about whatever we decide to name our children, as if it's anyone else's decision but the parents. In the New York Times article, How a Bit of All Can Improve Your Health, It argues that while awe is not defined as one of the six basic emotions of anger, surprise, disgust, enjoyment, fear, and sadness, it is in fact critical to our well-being. Awe, in fact, can cut through life's stress and calm us down by triggering the release of oxytocin in our bodies. And we need awe in life to balance out the weariness Dr. Dakar Keltner, a psychologist at the University of California in Berkeley, says that awe is the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends our understanding of the world. He found that new research shows that awe activates the vagal nerves, clusters of neurons in the spinal cord that regulate various bodily functions and slows our heart rate, relieves digestion, and deepens breathing. It also has psychological benefits. Many of us have a critical voice in our head telling us we're not smart, beautiful, or rich enough. Awe seems to quiet that negative self-talk. Dr. Keltner said, by activating the default mode and that part of our cortex involved in how we perceive ourselves. Sharon Salzberg, a leading mindfulness teacher and author, also sees awe as a vehicle to quiet our inner critic. All, she believes, is the absence of self-preoccupation. Did you hear that? All is understood to be the absence of self-preoccupation. All is a way to get outside of ourselves, our own head, our own narcissistic tendencies to make everything about us. When Elizabeth and Zachariah had John in their old age, and Elizabeth then named him something not familial, and Zachariah agreed, and then was able to speak for the first time in nine months, people were in such amazement and awe at their circumstances, they quit quit thinking about their own for a brief moment, long enough to talk to others about it with a sense of wonder 
and mystery. Who was this? What was going on here? How can this be happening in their hometown? They were filled with awe, and it transported them beyond themselves to something much larger. When has that happened to you? When have you been filled with awe in such a way that it transported you out of your circumstances, out of yourself? In 1999, Steve and I went to the beach with college friends. We had just gone to bed when they came rushing back into the house saying that we had to come to the beach. They couldn't really explain what they had seen, but they told us we had to see it too. We were sleepy and a little frustrated at being disturbed, but we went. When we got to the ocean, we were struck with awe because the waves were glowing. We didn't have the words for what we were seeing. We had never heard of it, but now we know it was bioluminescence, and it was one of the most awe-inspiring things I have ever witnessed in my life. And yes, we were a little afraid. We wanted to swim in the glowing ocean, but we didn't because we didn't know if it was safe or not. In 2013, we took our kids to Brazil and visited Steve's hometown. On our last night there, Steve took us to the, from our small resort where we were staying to the dunes behind us. Our family played in gigantic sand dunes until dark, skiing down the dunes in what is called in Brazil, scabunda. I was filled with awe. During snowpocalypse here in Birmingham, as Steve and I hiked home from downtown Homewood to Vestavia over six miles, I was filled eventually with awe of the beauty of everything, covered in white, of people helping one another alongside the road. It was beautiful heartwarming, a little scary, totally awe-inspiring. Of course, I was filled with awe holding my babies after they were born. But awe is not just reserved for these once-in-a-lifetime moments. Awe can come whenever we slow down and pay attention to life around us. I've been filled with awe at sunsets. Sunsets over the water, over the mountains, over Highway 31, driving through town. I've been filled with awe at seeing the early morning dark sky that is the color of Advent blue. I've been filled with awe when I find a large oyster or clam shell at the lake. I often gasp with awe at seeing shooting stars or the Milky Way above me. I'm filled with awe when I see neighbors coming together to clean up one another's yards after a storm or playing together in the streets after a snowfall. I was filled with awe when Mary Evelyn sent me her poem that is on the cover of our bulletin today. And I was filled with awe just two weeks ago when Jessica Yarbrough came to church on the morning that she would give birth to her and Erica's son, Joseph. Opportunities to be awestruck, they're all around us. But the more we keep our nose to the grindstone of our own life, work, worry, work, worry, the harder it becomes to be awestruck. We need more awe in our life and more mystery. And Dr. Keltner says we can cultivate it. We cultivate a life of all by paying attention to what is going on around us. Secondly, we focus on the moral beauty of others. What is good about others? We intentionally look for it. We regularly practice mindfulness as this quiets our mind and allows us to be present and open. And finally, we intentionally choose unfamiliar paths so that we are opening ourselves up to new and different things. Finding out awe in life regularly helps us balance the burdens of weariness and reminds us all shall be well. It does this in part because all helps us not be preoccupied with just our own life, but invites us to recognize the vastness of the universe and our important but small part in it. It keeps us humble and hopefully grateful. Dr. Keltner writes, people who find awe all around them are more open to new ideas, to what is unknown, to what language can't describe. For nine months, Zachariah couldn't describe what happened to his family. 
and what mysterious, wonderful thing God was doing in their lives. But when he finally could, when he could articulate his amazement, it filled others with awe too. Awe, real awe can't be kept to ourselves. So friends, slow down this week and pay attention to what each of us can see so that we may be the kind of church and the kind of people who find awe-inspiring life all around us. And when we do, may we not keep it to ourselves. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you now join in our affirmation of faith? We believe in a God who knows our names, who counts the hairs on our heads, and carries the dreams in our hearts. We believe that God's fingerprints are all over creation, and that God is forever speaking to us in a million different ways. We believe that awe and wonder, goosebumps and laughter, telling stories and paying attention are all ways that we can say thank you to our creating, sustaining, and loving God. Therefore, we commit ourselves to moving through this world with eyes wide open, with porous hearts, and grateful spirits. We commit ourselves to living lives of awe, wonder, and gra gratitude, trusting that these things will forever draw us deeper into God's loving arms. We believe. We stand in awe. Thanks be to God. family of faith. Remember, as you leave this time of worship, you go out into a weary world. So go speaking tenderly. Hold on to hope. Seek out connection. 
Be the love that the world needs. And remember, you are Christ beloved. You are enough. You belong and you are precious. In Jesus' holy and powerful name, in the name of God who is our creator, our savior, and sustainer. Alleluia. Amen. This is my winter song to you. The storm is coming soon. It rolls up from the sea. My voice a beacon in the night. My words will be your light to carry you to me. His love alive. His love alive. They say that things just cannot grow Beneath the winter snow Or so I have been told They say we're very far just like a distant star, I simply cannot hold His love alive, His love alive, His love alive. This is my winter song. My love, a beacon.